Institute webinar. I'm, um, it's my honor and my privilege today to welcome Neelam, Professor Neelam Hussain, who has joined the SOAS in South Asia Institute as Professor of Practice. And um, to, she will be doing a series of webinars with us, a series of three, and today is the first webinar. And I hope you will return to hear her for the second and third webinars. The second webinar will take place during our Festival of Ideas, which is happening in the third week of um, October. And the details are available on the South Asia Institute website and will be sent out in the newsletter as well. So my job right now is to give an introduction to Professor Neelam Hussain and to set up the session that she will speak for 40 minutes and after that we will take questions and um, I'm very much looking forward to, <clears throat> to this session. Um, I know Neelam uh, from a very long time ago and having been a former student so this is always a terrifying moment where you have to introduce a former teacher and, and, and do a decent job. So I hope I, I'll do justice. Uh, Professor Neelam Hussain read BA honors in English literature from Kinnaird College. And uh, for the MA degree, she did at Government College Lahore, followed by a master's at Leeds and postgraduate research at Sussex. <clears throat> She was a lecturer at Kinnaird in 1974 and, and longer um, uh, and was a faculty member there till 1995 with a break in between when you were at Sussex. Um, <clears throat> and um, after uh, Kinnaird, uh, Neelam left to work at Seymour Women's Resource and Publication Centre in 1995. For those of you who don't know about Seymour, Seymour is a secular feminist not-for-profit organization and uh, where Neelam is the executive coordinator. Her work entails direct involvement in both academic and field research and she is involved in a in, in a project and a large number of things and including the editing and publication of a social legal journal called Bayan. Neelam is, um, do, does a lot of other things. And I, uh, if I started to go into details of everything, I'll be here for a long time. So I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, her work has included the production and publication of an annotated selection of Punjabi folk tales documented by British folklorists during the Raj. And I do have a prop with me. I have one of those books here, right? The Romance of Raja, if you can see it, and other tales, which is an absolutely beautiful tome. And I recommend that you get it if you don't have it. Um, <clears throat> he's done translation from Urdu to English of two novels, Inner Courtyard by Khatija Mastur and All Passion Spent by Zahida Hena. Her research lies in exploring how gendered structures and cultural norms in Pakistan shape women's experiences and narratives. She, she's currently involved with research on forced marriage and women's inheritance rights. Her recent research has been on the Pathways to Women's Empowerment Program and the Changing Narratives of Sexuality and has highlighted various forms of sexual and gender-based violence in Pakistan. <clears throat> And through her work, Neelam has engaged a community of workers building networks with young people, especially women in Pakistan. Neelam's work informs knowledge exchange, research consultancy and fundraising. And as an educationist, her vast experience of working with students in the state sector in Pakistan has contributed to writing workshops for women at the Lahore College University. She has also written features for the Friday Times, the News on Sunday. Her co-edited book, Engendering the Nation State, is an excellent resource and widely quoted. She is um, also now as global, uh, <clears throat> as a professor of practice, we. We are enriched by Neelam's presence and look forward to working with her and um, to listening to her as, um, as somebody, my, um, in terms of my own work, I was influenced very strongly by a workshop that I 
by a writing exercise that I did for her a very long time ago, and I don't think she'll remember this, which was about the media representation of uh, women, uh, of, of rape victims in Pakistan. And, and, you know, that was quite a seminal moment for me. It, it led to a lot of work that I've done on representation um, and Muslim communities in the diaspora. But um, I would now like to hand over to Neelam, who will be talking today about the Punjabi folk or wonder tale. So thank you, Neelam, and welcome. Thank you, Amla. That was a very nice introduction. I wish there were more people to do that for me. Uh, professor of practice makes me feel a bit like James Bond. I hope that's not your expectation from this talk today which is on the Punjabi folk tale. Uh, the stories that I will be discussing are based mainly on the work done by British folklorists, Flora Annie Steele, the Reverend Charles Swinnerton, and R.C. Temple, all of whom, though assisted by the Munshi, had a working knowledge of the local language or vernacular and were actively engaged in the process of listening and documenting to the tales. As Swinnerton, I think, describes rather evocatively, sitting there on the veranda as the mosquito sings in the, sings in the night and listening to the bard Juma talking about the Salu and his adventures. <clears throat> uh, I will make an RC temple. And I, this was work done in the middle, probably late 19th century. And uh, tangentially, I may, if there is time, refer to the work, the stories written by A.R. Khatun, a woman writer whose roots lie in the middle class, inner courtyard Muslim life of the Zanana, or at least the inner courtyard. And uh, just to show how to emphasize or highlight the fluidity and absorptive capacity of the folk tale, which picks up and drops information and events and small ancillary details at, as it flows along. And yet there are moments when that flow is interrupted and fixed in time as the folklorists did for the Indian folk tale and Air Khatun did for it yet again in the 20th century. And we still have our living storytellers and bards who have, and I would love to find out where the story is, folk tale is now, given Islamization and extremism and all that. But that's another story. I'll be looking at three aspects of the Punjabi folk tale. One is a brief, I hope, comment on the folk tale as a genre, as a literary genre. Then, I want to look at the differences or the points of divergence between the European folktale and the Punjabi folktale, which points to or makes us look at the moments of when they were documented and what were the politics behind that moment of documentation. Uh, my, my premise and, and the third will be a look at the characteristics of the Punjabi folktale many of which differentiate it from or distinguish it from certainly the European folktale and probably other folktales also, though there will be obviously a lot of commonalities between the Punjabi and folktales from other parts of South Asia and India and Bangladesh. Uh, my premise is that language and form and jar are the twin sites where meaning is made and our ways of seeing and experiencing the world are shaped. That storytelling, whether as folktale, fiction, or any other narrative form, is not only an intrinsic part of human subjectivity, but also has deep psychological, social, and political dimensions. This is borne out by the fact that there is no story and no culture without stories, where people don't tell stories. That my other point is that we narrativize inchoate experience in order not only to make sense of it, but like the fourth uh, game of the Freudian child, imposing a pattern on his mother's mysterious, mysterious comings and goings. It's an attempt, narrativization is an attempt to gain some control over our individual and collective experience 
And as testified by Sherazad, we spin out stories to negotiate time, space, and save our lives. As a genre, the folk tale orig originated in popular culture and was passed on by word of mouth. Its roots go back to the time, to a time when as part of the oral tradition, it was communal property and expressed the needs and wishes of ordinary people. Predating the written word in the book, the folk tale is not so much as the sum of the manners and habits of the people to which it belongs, but as argued by Marina Warner in her fantastic book, From the Beast to the Blonde, it is an imaginative apprehension of the known and knowable world in which the boundaries of the permissible and the impermissible were charted out. Folk tales, again, I'm referring to Marina Warner, Folk tales build a second life and a second world outside officialdom, where established categories and norms become interchangeable and are challenged. Even as the element of the marvelous that characterizes the folk and fairy tale endow them with the potential to open up spaces of dreaming alternatives. And that's again, Marina, one of the last sentence. Uh, if we look at the folk tale, it is heterogeneous. It is anarchic. It depicts a varied and undifferentiated world where different genres, the high romance mixes and mingles with the homespun wisdom of ordinary people, where animals speak and princes of unparalleled valor and lineage keep company with carpenters, tailors, dharns, domes, mirassis, thieves, parrots, hedgehogs, dogs, and horses and where saints and holy men, villains and ogres, fearless beauties and buffoons, shape shifters and rogues rub shoulders, and the irreverent exuberance of people's laughter demolishes alike the pomp and circumstance of kings and the austerity of saints and, and grants them equal value. Uh, however, the ease with which the wonder tale appropriates and incorporates different narrative traditions should not create the impression that it is totally all over the place. The folk tale has its own protocols and its own rules, which may not be set aside. So, E.g., help to a stranger is a positive quality. Neglect of someone in need is a negative quality. And thus we find in the Punjabi and the Risalu tales that time and again the phrase is repeated. Then the heart of Rasalu was moved within him. And it triggers off not just the, I mean, before he takes some action, and then that action triggers off the next stage of the story. Uh, <clears throat> the Punjabi folk tale is uh, not an exception to the unwritten rules of the universal folk tale. And uh, it is also nomadic. It travels across borders and boundaries and takes root in different soils, where though the storylines are retained, the, it takes on local characteristics, language use, idioms, manners, etc., etc., to acquire a local identity. And that is why the tales of Bidpai, written in 8th century AD, the Brahmin Bidpai of India, traveled across the uh, well, Persia and on into Europe, and were used by Charles Perrault, who, who then took them, rewrote them, and they were then known as, they became the apogee of Gallic culture. So that is, again, something which is very specific to the folk tale, or maybe to other narrative forms also, but definitely to the uh, folk tale. The other point I want to emphasize is the folk tale, despite its fantastic terrain and use of marvels and wonders, the folk tale does not exist outside history. It is temporally located and culturally contexted. It is omnivorous, it is eclectic, it transgresses categorical boundaries and draws upon different narrative forms, such as the Punjabi, uh, the epic or the Punjabi war, as freely as it does the, on the open-ended tropicality of jokes and riddles and the kissa, the dastan, the lyricism of the love song, the dhola, the maya, and the body irreverence of the sitchni, 
and the gossip of the marketplace and the intimacies of the zanana. All are grist to its mill. Uh, a bit of an explanation about the jars. The var or epic expresses the aristocratic line in literature. Therefore, even within the magical promiscuity of the wonder tale, it represents a predominantly masculinist strain and espouses established truths. They may be the truths of the story, but they are established. And bound by the exigencies of time, class, gender, and status, circumscribed by its own particular code of honor, couched in the language of valor and prowess, and the prowess in the, on the battlefield, its heroes and heroines must ultimately submit to the genre's formal demands. Therefore, the Rajas, Salvahan, and Rasalu must uphold the honor of kings. And the Rani's Kokila and Luna walked at every step can only betray. Now, in the magical romance, on the other hand, unburdened by the epic dimensions of the war, the same themes of love tra and transgression take on different meanings. Thus, in, if in the Rasalu legend, Luna has no recourse but to succumb to the poison of unrequited love in an unequal marriage, and the Wazir's daughter must suffer public humil humiliation for daring to laugh at the Prince Rasalu. Uh, in the magical romance, the fate of the blacksmith's daughter for a similar challenge to masculine pride is very different. Prince Wool marries her so that he may punish her for her transgression, but ends up providing her with the opportunity to establish her dominance over him. Uh, it would seem that the very contempt with which society views women in real life is subverted in the magical romance and opens up opportunities for them to exercise their wit and demonstrate their capabilities. Now, if the epic and magical romance deploy the fantastic to build a desired and desirable world, where the certitudes and the fixities of the real world become elastic, the comic tale uses the fantastic in ways that turns them inside out. The larger laughter, as we all know, is inherently anti-authority. And the comic tale with its roots in the carnivalesque and also in the annual carnival or mela of the Sufi, side, Sufi shrines is bound up with people's unofficial truths as opposed to the orthodox verities of the ruling classes. Uh, the larger than life heroes and heroines of the ethical strain and the self-absorbed lovers of the magical romance proceed into the background in the comic tale. Instead of Rasalu on his dark gray mare, vanquishing giants and winning plaudits, there is Isra making his way, making away with his fraudulently acquired gold as far as his ass, ass as in donkey, can carry him. And the image of Fazal Moon irritably breaking the empty pot on her husband's head for demanding more food than he knows when he knows there is none, replaces those of the Kokilas and Lunas and other princesses dealing with the impossible demands of kings and courtly life. Heroes turn lawless clowns in the comic tale, and the heroines relinquishing the luxuries of the palace bow become wily and cunning and, and trap kings into admitting they lie. The, the, spot, the spotlight of the comic tale is on ordinary people, on the old wife and the bard, on the bhart, the mirasi, the viran, the jogi, the fakir, and all that ilk that R.C. Temple talks about. Looking down from the heights conferred by status and class, the uncompromising eye of authority may see them only as a sorry set of drunkards. But in the comic tale, differences of caste, class, along with taboos and prohibitions that maintain these distinctions are erased, and nobody escapes the irreverent, all-inclusive spontaneity of people's laughter, including the ones who are doing the laughing. Nothing escapes it. Whereas the, whereas the humor is parodic and deadpan as in the tale of the sagacious Lombardar, where an awestruck audience multitude watches the depredations of the Lombardar whose wisdom is in everybody's mouth, or expressed in the open enjoyment of the absurd when the family of we a whole family of weavers lament the death of a child yet to be conceived to a maiden by a maiden yet to be wed. There is again, so there's no room for dogma in the in the comic tale. This, but this seeming in concern with all things seri with serious cannot be taken at face value. It is imbued in the carnivalesque spirit, uh, imbued in the carnivalesque spirit, the laughter of the comic tale represents what Bakhtin calls the gay and free laughing aspect of the world with, with its unfinished open character and the joy of change and renewal. 
And it is precisely in this joyous, open-ended view of the world that the transformative power of the comic tale and of people's laughter is to be found. Instead of affirming the truth, the triumph of truths already established, it replaces them with uncertainty and in so doing opens up spaces where truth may not be found, but what claims to be true may be questioned and tested. Clearly, there's no room here for heroics and grand betrayals of the epic world. Transferred to its terrain, relieved of their re heroic stature, the heroes and heroines of the epic world lose their tragic integrity. And revealed instead is the hypocrisy and the double standards of those in power. Seen from below, Raja Salvahan emerges as a mere cuckold, a ridiculous figure recalling the stereotype of an old man trying to control Luna, a, young, a wife young enough to be his daughter. The same action transfer, trans, is transformed into a parodic gesture with Luna's pursuit of Puran who doesn't want her. It mirrors Salvahan's desire for a woman who is with him only because she cannot be elsewhere. The king upholding his dwindling virility is no different from the lust-crazed woman chasing a reluctant lover. Faced with these images, which so clearly belong to the realm of the joke, the grand patriarchal discourse of betrayal and retribution dissolves and becomes insubstantial. Distripped of their heroic dimensions, Salvahan and Luna lose their destructive power and are brought down to the same plane as the young weaver who goes hungry in order to impress his in-laws with the refinement of his manners. Or the wily Isra and his friend, the equally wily Kanesra, who attempt to defraud each other with the greatest good humor and understanding. Who brought face to face with the all-inclusive irreverence of laughter, official morality loses its edge and, as well as its punitive power. What needs to be again remembered is that this is not the simple merriment of a holiday mood, but philosophical laughter that exposes and destroys the hypocrisies and hollowness of old official morality and clears the way for renewal and change, and in the process has the potential to redefine and articulate the boundaries of the permissible and impermissible. Uh, I. This, I just want to say that this mingling of the epic and the ma magical uh, in, uh, in the presence of the comic shower of people's laughter, the world seen from below is granted, gets a double vision, gives a grants a double vision to these tales to and to points to the countless untold stories that lie in the heart of the stories that are being told. Uh, I'll, I won't continue with this. I think I should stop here because we do have to finish in a given amount of time and also because we'll be bored stiff if I go on rambling forever. So, so much for the genre. Uh, now the historical and political context of the Punjabi South Asian folk tale and its Euro European counterpart and why there are no Cinderella's in the Punjabi folk tale. Uh, Briefly, with the coming of the written word, the locus of power shifted, bards, minstrels lost status, and the folk tale became the repository of the unlettered mass of marginalized people and traditional storytellers, and all the minstrels, the troubadours, the bards, the low caste entertainers, and so on. Uh, but as stated earlier, the folk tale exists in historical time and is temporally and geographically located. Uh, and the discovery and documentation of the European, specifically the German folk tale and that of the Punjabi or South Asian folk tale in the 19th century, spring from different aims, different contexts and motivations and follow different trajectories despite the shared generic characteristics of the genre and, and even storylines. Now, a brief look at the German context. The folk tale was the discovery of the folk tale and the establishment of the modern study of folklore and the development of the literary folk tale by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, Grimm in, initiated a process of documenting, selecting and reworking the stories narrated by ordinary people. This process was part of a nationalist quest for a folk, folk, folk geist located in some ancient past but informed by the spirit of Calvinism, Calvinist reform. 
Writing about the way the Grimm brothers rework their tales, Jack Zipes points out that what deserves to be preserved and what is left out, what is to be, whether it be high, middle, or low art, depends on the cultivators of culture. And cul the cultivators of culture, and this has always been a class matter because the cultivators of culture have always been part of a consortium of the ruling social groups in history. So according to Zipes, the Grimm brothers eliminated the erotic and sexual elements that might have been offensive to middle class morality. They added numerous Christian expressions and references, emphasized the specific role models for male and female protagonists, according to the dominant patriarchal code of the time, and endowed many of the tales with a homey flavor by the use of diminutives, quaint expressions, and cute descriptions. They also added numerous Christian expressions and emphasized the role models for male and female protagonists in accordance with the patriarchal code of their time and society, including a punitive morality. Uh, Zeib's argument is borne out again by the research he has done. Uh, he compares two versions of Rapunzel, that documented in 1812 and the next one in 1857. Now, just listen to the differences. In the first uh, version, when Rapunzel first saw the king, at first she felt was afraid, then took a liking to the king and made an agreement with him. He was to come every day and be pulled up. Thus they lived merrily and joyfully, and the fairy did not discover anything, until one day Rapunzel said, tell me, Mother Gottel, why do you think my clothes have become too tight for me and no longer fit? The 1857 version begins with the meeting, but Look, notice the change of tone. Rapunzel was at first terribly afraid, for she had never laid eyes on a man before. Then the prince began to talk to her in a friendly way. He told her how he, her song had touched his heart so deeply that he had not been able to rest until he had seen her. Rapunzel then lost her fear. And when he asked her whether she would have him for a husband, and she saw that he was young and handsome, she said yes, and placed her hand in his. Meanwhile, the sorceress did not notice anything until one day Rapunzel said, Mother Gottel, how is it that you're much heavier than the prince? It's a, quite a shift. The first passage is down to earth, unselfconscious. The second is longer, belongs to a middle class drawing room courtship with its undertones of repressed sexuality. While the ma marriage proposal and Rapunzel placing her hand in that of the prince are resonant of the spirit of genteel propriety with the sugar icing of permissible romance. Especially interesting are the transference of agency from Rapunzel in the first version to the king in the second one, all and also the textual shift from Rapunzel's sexual body to Mother Gotham's body that has outlived its sexual appeal in the 1957, 1857 version. It was very different with the Punjabi folktale. The Punjabi folktale represented the colonized other of the Raj. It was seen, it, has a, it had a practical function as a window into the native mind for administrative purposes. Therefore, it escaped the sanitizing impulse, even as it was spared the punitive morality of the European folktale, and also the passive gentility of its heroines. Uh, as stated by R.C. Temple, the Indian folktale was the preserve of the old wife and the bard, the bhand, the bhart, the mirasi, the bharan, the jogi, the fakir, and all that ilk who were at best a sorry set of drunkards. Orientalist folklorists were under no compulsion to idealize or glorify the stories they heard. If anything, the tricks, deceptions, and uninhibited engagement with bodily functions and the irreverent, often body humor that are the stock and trade of the folk tradition may well have been seen as hallmarks of an inferior culture. Where the Grimm brothers were reworking the German folk tale to fit in with the bourgeois values of their time, in the Punjab and elsewhere in the colonized world, there was an attempt to delink what was noble and worthy in the folk tale from its local moorings and trace it either to a virtually dehistoricized ancient Brahminical origins or to Greek mythology. E.G. Swinnerton explains the spirits of Mir Shikari in the Rasalu tales, Ranjha and the god Krishna piping down the valleys of the Punjab as echoes of the Greek Orpheus and as mnemic remnants of Alexander's foray into the Punjab. This perhaps explains the virtual absence of the passive sexuality of the Cinderella's and Snow White's 
as well as the blurring of the male-female, the good and bad binary, not just among women, but also among heroes and villains, among others. Uh, in a sense, the Punjabi folktale is much closer to her pre-Grimsian counterpart, or even to the Chaucerian good whiff of Bath in her claims to agency and the physicality of her sexualized material body. She's feisty, she's witty, she's quick thinking, she's quarrelsome, argumentative, irreverent, transgressive. She challenges authority, laughs at princes, husbands, kings, and jinns, dares off for love or whatever else she happens to have set her heart on. And what is most significant, repeatedly rescues the prince from the dangers and perils of his complacence and uh, egocentric folly. This is a recurrent theme. I was quite interested, uh, you know, amused when I saw it. Time and again, the prince goes off adventuring. The princess goes after him disguised as a man because she knows where her safety lies as, you know, and uh, ends up rescuing him through the use of her wits and her fundamental humanity. Uh, therefore, the, and the quick wits of the farmer's daughter expose the hypocrisy of kings and courts and enable him to marry her, enable her to marry him and rise to the status of his guide and mentor in the story called The King and the Four Girls. Rani Sundra in the Puran uh, legend demands, uh, in the Rasalu legend, demands Puran as a gift from Guru Goraknath when he rebels and advances. Rani Sankhni rejects Rasalu's suit because having seen the goldsmith's son, she prefers him to the prince, Rasalu. She connives and contrives to woo him and win him and transgresses caste class boundaries to marry him. Surprisingly, in the face of today's honor-killing ethos that is single-mindedly traced to culture and tradition, it is Rasalu who discovers Sankhni's inclinations and enables the cross-class, cross-caste marriage between the lovers. Kokila, Rasalu's child, bride, taunts her husband. I know not whether I'm wife or daughter, but if a touch can cost you one third of your strength, how will it fare with you for sons and daughters? And, the exercise, and, and she exercises agency when she gives up her life for her adulterous love for the Raja Hodi. And she, I quote, Raja, sitting you will reproach me, standing you will abuse me. I too must die with him who is my approach. The point to be noticed is, Noted is she does not lose her life as punishment for infidelity. It is not taken from her. She takes it in an exercise of agency that leaves Rasalu desolate and also marks the end of his kingdom and his life. Now, among the many reasons, there must be many, I mean, I'm not a folklorist, for the difference between the Punjabi uh, folk tale and especially the female protagonist and her European counterpart, but Perhaps one that makes most sense is the difference in value systems and therefore of perceptions of what is laudable and positive and what is worthy of condemnation in a pluralist, pre-capitalist agrarian society that foregrounds family and kin group values. And on the other hand, the demands of a Puritan capitalist ethic of a newly emerging nation state. The separate spheres ideology of gender roles along with notions of European individualism were amalgamated into the literary folktale to meet the demands of a bourgeois readership. Obedience, sexual passivity, and sweetness of temper were highlighted as positive characteristics for women, especially heroines. And the taming of the shoe is again a recurrent theme that runs through the folk tales. also. Uh, I think it is in the story of King Thrushman there that it happens, but I don't have the book in front of me, so I won't say definitely it's that one. Agency and the active pursuit of desire, which were main prerogatives, tended to become negative and even evil when appropriated by women, who, do, who then appear in the guise of crafty stepmothers, jealous queens, ugly sisters, and evil witches on thrones. As opposed to the sin of disobedience that triggers misfortune and, and punishment in the European tale, other than the suppression or, or excision of the sexual dimension with which the element of people, and with it the element of people's humor, the most noteworthy addition to the tales by Grimm's and Charles Perrault is a calculating and punitive morality, which is not to say that the Punjabi folktale is free of retribution, violence, and revenge. In the Punjabi folktale, where obedience is or disobedience is a grievous sin in the European folktale, Snow White eats the apple, 
Cinderella forgets the time, the sleeping beauty uh, violates the spindle taboo. In the Punjabi folktale and perhaps in the South Asian folktale, fidelity in women is priced above girls across cultures. And, and as fidelity in any case is priced above girls as, as patriarchal cultures depend on more male control of female sexuality. And yet, as exemplified by Bhagalbat, this is the one area where the mechanisms of control are the weakest. Bhagalbat is a giantess in the Rasalu legend. We'll come back to her. In the subcontinent, where the emphasis is heavily on caste, purity, and lineage, virtue in women, and when women, virtue is almost always related to sexual behavior, takes on a special significance. It is hardly surprising that when it comes to the exercise of sexual agency and or disloyalty to the king husband, the very elastic and accommodating horizons of the wonder tale tighten and shrink. This is evidenced in the tragic fates of Luna, Kokila, and Rani Sundra. Punishment is, is certainly visited on villains, but it lacks, in the, again, in the Punjabi folktale, I'm moving now, we're talking of the punitive quality of the European and the lack of it in uh, the Punjabi folktale. Punishment is certainly visited on villains, but it lacks the quality and bloodthirsty vindictiveness to be found in Grimm's. Cinderella's ugly stepsisters have their eyes pecked out by pigeons in a slow, performance coming and going in and going out of church. In the six swans, the wicked stepmother-in-law was tied to a stake and burnt to ashes. In Snow White, the evil queen is made to put on red hot iron slippers and dance on, until she falls down dead. And in the pink flower, the old king has the villainous cook torn into four parts. In the Punjabi tale, on the other hand, the tyrannical Raja Sirkup's punishment for his cruelty and cunning, though humiliating, does not match the degree and kind of violence witnessed above. He's made to draw lines with his nose on a red hot riddle till, till it is badly singed. Uh, this is in Riz, the tale called Rasalu and, and Raja Sirka. Uh, then again, there are not too many instances of the villain being actually killed as punishment for his or her crimes. And the two examples that come to mind, and these are significant examples, uh, in the Swinnerton Temple, Flora Anisil's selection of tales are those of the giantess Bhagalbhat, who meets her end in a cauldron of boiling oil, and the smooth-talking crow with a vagrant eye, who fraudulently claims the swan wife for his own and is shot for his pains. Now, this choice of villains deserving extreme punishment is also significant, as the two pose a fundamental threat to what constitutes the cornerstone of patriarchy namely the patrilineal, patrilocal, caste-based conjugal unit. Bhagalbat represents rampant female sexuality, and the adulterous crow is no respecter of marital sanctity. That of the two, Bhagalbat meets the more horrific death, to be shot with a pellet from Rasalu's sling is preferable to being boiled in oil, is understandable. The crow, after all, is caught doing all, only what other men do or want to do. Bhagalbat, on the other hand, covered with hair to her ankles and teeth like two iron plowshares, hints at and shows the link between female sexuality and subterranean primeval drives that are the most difficult to discipline and control and provides a glimpse of the ambiguity and disorder on which the social cultural order rests. Uh, then again, a comparison between why Sirkup isn't punished uh, the crow and the Bhagalbat face summary death. They should face summary death in Sirkap, who has built a gateway of skulls of the men he has killed, beheaded his own brother in a game of chopper, and is willing to kill his infant daughter, Kokila, to save his life, is merely discomforted and made to look ridiculous. Again, provides interesting insights into the working system, workings of the value systems, patriarchal mores, and political pragmatism that undergirds the folktale. Sirkup's gate of skulls, so reprehensible, is an indicator of the king's father's power. It is condemnable only in that it signifies excess, and not because killing people in it is int intrinsically wrong when it comes to rulers and monarchs. How else, after all, can the territorial integrity of kingdoms and the obedience of subjects be maintained? Interestingly, I was, when I was reading it, I, it reminded me, it recalls Macbeth's, I may do all that becomes a man, he who does more is none. And so 
Sirkup's punishment is in keeping with his position and his power. Uh, again, to refer to Marina Warner, she knows what she's talking about when she claims that the bubble of nonsense which comprises the elements of magic and fantasy in the folk tale simultaneously hide and recall harsh realities. Uh, so the other distinguishing characteristics of the Punjabi folk tale that are of particular interest, and I'll name only three because I think we'll be getting tired by now, uh, are uh, loyalty to the family of Hindu, uh, as hallmark of positive behavior in women and men rather than unquestioning obedience to impersonal authority or, given, or a given belief system. And thus, Rasalu from, is prevented from wreaking vengeance on his father by the five beasts from Makkah who hold back his hand, forbidding him to harm his father. Even though Rasalu was a Hindu and uh, Salvahan was a Hindu and Rasalu newly converted to Islam until it comes to the past that father and son become reconciled. Uh, the other point which is characteristic, which is missing or certainly characteristic of the Punjabi tale is the element of androgyny. The binary oppositions of the Grimm's and Perrault's stories are dissolved in, are replaced by a kind of androgynous uh, blurring. Male-female roles may be socially allocated, but the ways in which sexual identity is negotiated are diverse. Deeply nuanced and shot through with ambiguity. And I quote here, Ho oh, rider of the dark grey mare, did you forget to bind your hair? Like some girls all loosely tied, it flies away about from side to side, teases Rasalu's betrothed as he comes riding by. Conversely, on encountering Rani Sokni and her maidens, Rasalu says, Rasalu is pleasantly surprised to see such goodly company. He stops them and asks, who are you and where are you going? You are dressed like as men, but you walk like women. And in another quotation, which I don't have here, is when I think it is in uh, the, Gul, the blacksmith's daughter's story when she's dressed as a prince and the comment is, and very handsome she looked. And again, there are undercurrents of uh, uh, a bisexuality about the, uh, the remark. So the other, uh, the other point is where I, again, the established binaries are blurred is in the hero villain dyad. And I think this is very important because it brings in an element of doubt, uncertainty, compassion into the situation. Rasalu is chasing man-eating ogres who have been devouring one by one the young men and women of a village. He is there to vindicate, to save the son of a poor widow whose only child is to be sacrificed. And so Rasalu is the hero. He is a good man. And, but this blurring of identity with the, between the hero villain diet enables a more compassionate understanding of the nuanced complexities of the human predicament, as exemplified by Thiria's slide from man eating ogre to victim. Injured and bleeding, witness to the destruction of his brothers and the passing away of his familiar world, Thiria cries out his bewilderness and pain. You have cut off my arm and killed my brothers. Why still pursue me? And later, oh God, you alone are, are my savior. He won't let me alone. And it is at this moment that Thiria, entirely human in his anguish, ceases to be the villain, just as at the same time, Rasalu, in his single-minded pursuit to destroy the giants, relinquishes his humanity to become both implacable avenger and inexorable fate. Now, uh, Amna, you have to tell me how much time there is left. Is there time to say a little bit about Air Khatun, or do we wind up here and go on to the question answers? Um, I think you have um, a bit of time. Do you have another five minutes? Okay, I'll rush through Air Khatun. Now, Air Khatun, the next set of stories is by Air Khatun. 
Uh, the comparison between the two sets of tales shows how stories are inflected by historical political contexts and status and class location of the narrative voice. Uh, apart from the fact that she wrote immensely, immensely popular romantic no novels for women that were later televised by Pakistan TV, very little is known about A.R. Khatun, at least very little written information is available. I'm sure she's well known among her own circles, or was. Uh, in fact, I don't even know what her, the AR stands for. And Khatun is a generic name for woman or lady. So even that is a mystery. Um, in her introduction, the only clues we have on her are provided by her in her introduction to her novel of Shah. Her roots and the beginnings of her life as a writer lay in the inner courtyard culture of Delhi's Muslim salariat class, the gentry or the ashraf that emerged under Mughal uh, colonial rule, she began her life as a writer there. She speaks of the disruption caused by partition in 1947 and the subsequent move to post-independence Lahore and describes herself as a woman with no formal schooling and no knowledge of any language or literature than her own mother tongue, Urdu. Now, Ea Khatun's uh, collection, and I get clues into Ea Khatun's life through these stories is a motley of stories comprising improving tales, reminiscent of Charlotte M. Young's 19th century writings. And the magical while the magical tales of kings, princesses, and evil witches and sorcerers are told by her, they carry a distinct flavor of, and of bourgeois aspirations of, of turn of the century pre-partition Delhi Muslim household with all its nostalgia for a pre-lapsarian courtly past, probably Bajid Ali Shah's Lucknow as it existed in popular memory. Because there's a lot of history in her novels, there is a huge amount of historical inaccuracy. The folk tales don't require accuracy, but it's the, the spirit is there. Uh, the changes, and although her stories begin in the ritual uh, storytelling style of Hamara, Tumara, Khuda, Baadsha, you know, a ritual sort of thing, saying, and now I begin to tell my tale. Uh, the, the ethos and her particular ethos is reflected in the ancillary date uh, details of the stories in which, uh, of the stories. The protagonists spend a lot of time in ritual prayers. I mean, there was no evidence of that in... Uh, the tales documented by the British folklorists, except for maybe strategic re reasons. I mean, you could crash down in a temple or a mosque if you wanted to evade uh, arrest or, or something else, but not as an act of piety. Uh, and there, there is observa the observation is of Parda is strict, repeatedly, almost in every story, there is the line when the princess turned 12, she began to observe Parda. Then tents are set up, marquees are set up. When she walks out, there are corridors created between tents so that no profane male gaze may see her. And her virtue is unimpeachable despite abductions by jinns, witches, sorcerers, evil and friendly fairies. And in a way, when I was reading them, it reminded me of the history of uh, the Aligarh branch of the Anjuman Khawateen Islam, which was very much part of the, well, the Anjuman Khawateen maybe belonged to an earlier time than A.R. Khatun, or maybe the, you know, it was contemporaneous with her. But unlike the Lahore branch, which was politically active, uh, the Aligarh Anjuman and Khawateen spent more time than, on any, than necessary on checking out on the parda arrangements of their meetings. And members wouldn't come if they felt that there was a chink left between the uh, draperies where they could be seen. And, they, they, and these factors became issues. So it is that particular ethos that the these tales are coming out of, and it is reflected in them. Uh, palaces and palace gardens provide the setting for most tales. The jungle, the wilderness, the with all its signification, is absent in the Air Khatun tales. Uh, even and even when princes, prince, the prince or princess is transported to a jungle wilderness, 
Even there, she is surrounded by handmaidens and slaves, and the main protagonists don't have to lift a finger to meet their needs. The heroines, and indeed, even to a great extent, the heroes are more acted upon than acting. Crying and shedding tears is the only act of agency exercised by the heroines. And this they do copiously, consistently, and at the drop of a hat. They're all, by the way, very fair and pretty. Real agency belongs to authority figures. And it makes me think again of family hierarchies, where certainly in the earlier generation, the elders of the family, you couldn't say, go against their word, regardless of what the young, the young people wished for or desired. So real agency in these stories belongs to authority figures, but particularly, and particularly those with evil intent. So villains, the agency is with the villainous, because if you're balking desire, then you're obviously with the, with the villains, even if you're a parent, I suppose. Uh, this certainly provides insights into the workings of familial and social hierarchies. And, uh, and here in her tales, the elastic borders and boundaries and marvels and prodigies of the early version of folk tales are replaced by a different kind of excess. I mean, there is excess in the folk tale. I mean, the Alabin's cave of treasures. But uh, although that is remarkably absent in the Punjabi folk tale, I suppose, they reflect the Spartan quality of uh, people's lives to some extent. The, the wonder is in the exercise of magic and in the, uh, the cross-species, cross-caste, class uh, exchanges. Uh, the prodigies and marvels of the earlier folk tales are replaced by a different kind of excess, which is of things that are named and counted, almost like a household inventory. Inventory, And they strip the tales of their ambiguity and uncertainty and even the sense of wonder which should, should accompany them because there's a blaze of color, but you are counting, counting, counting. It's almost like a housewife checking on her, uh, on her, on her household goods. And uh, I mean, they're tediously told tales. They are boring tales. But again, I think they are interesting in the sense of the insights they do provide of changing times and changing ex moral and uh, social expectations. I think I'll end here. Uh, I had hoped to have the time to talk about the problems of recording living folk tales, but I think that will that'll take too long. Okay. Thank you, uh, Neelam. I think nowadays you can do uh, the kind of hand flap function, can't you, in the in the sort of virtual virtual signs and signals to say applause, to applause to function <laughs> to for to all the attendees to for a wonderfully rich um, narrative about the folk folk tale. And I think there's quite a lot you've covered beginning with the story as it start well going into it through the British fo folklorists and their cataloging and archiving of the information and then the actual stories and what they entail within the context of uh, the specific context of um, the example of Rasalu, I think the genre of the folktale, you've given us quite a deep insight into it from a European and a non-European lens as to what are the things that we might think about and, and how uh, magic and romance come together or sometimes simultaneously how religion comes into it, how heroes and heroines. Um, and, and also I think that that point you made just now about Punjabi folk tales, I thought was really fascinating that they're quite Spartan, but that the wonder lies in the exchange um, of um, cross caste exchange or those sorts of moments, uh, rather than wonder, I suppose, as we uh, might be thinking about in a European context. Um, so questions of agency and desire just to uh, I, I think it was interesting to hear what you what you thought about it and how you were engaging with Verena Warner's understanding of 
magic and, and fantasy as a way to hide and record harsh realities. And, and I think some of the things that we think about with regards to what might be the social function of folk tales, um, that they are very much there as part of people's everyday lives, but also storytelling plays such an important um, role in how people imagine themselves and how um, people interact. And also, I, I suppose I was also thinking because you were talking about the Rasalu context of Sabina Chunara's introduction to to that book in which she talks about how the uh, act of ethnography is deeply embedded with the functioning of, of how the folk tale gets archived and understood in, in the South Asian context. So anyway, the, I'm just doing a very quick summing up. I know people will have lots of questions and I don't want to abuse my position as chair. So I was going to invite um, participants to put their questions in the chat box, use the hand raise function and we'll uh, and put your questions to Neelam directly. I see there's a question from Maliha Sata or an observation. Uh, I don't know if Maliha, you would like to put this directly to Neelam, if you're there, still there. Yeah. Maliha, would you like to? Okay, unmute. Yeah. Hello, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, so this was a very fascinating talk and I was earlier talking about it. It's such a blessing, this COVID thing that now you can hear all these things, which probably you will never have time to read, but you can still, you know, learn about these interesting comparisons and I enjoyed every word of it. Um, interestingly, when I uh, started listening to it, I thought that you will be mentioning more of Paris Shah or... Uh, you know, Bullesha. But it's interesting that you have uh, talked about Rasalu and the characters, the female characters there. So with these new insights, I'll definitely go back to it again. I remember reading it long time ago. In fact, listening to these stories. And I was also thinking about the uh, Mastawakili, if, if you know about it, some more for, from Balochistan, actually. So it's interesting that how you can also see these patterns uh, uh, you know, in this region, uh, which are definitely very different from the stories that you have mentioned. For instance, the you mentioned Cinderella, right? Um, so uh, just only want to say that I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much for this. And also making it available for all of us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maliha. Um, are there any other questions? No, or thank you, you very much. Okay, thank you. Neelam, did you want did you want to respond to Maliha and, and the observation? Oh, I about... suggest to Maliha to read the stories. She'll enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are I mean obviously going to, stories are going to be different coming out of Balochistan or Bible Bakhtunkha or Sin, but the similarities are there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box or to raise your hand. And while we're waiting for questions, I can maybe engage you in further conversation, Neelam, uh, about the paper. So and ask you um, to, because you ended with A.R. Khatun, and I think the journey was really interesting in terms of this, this was the folk tale then, or this is the, the way it's written and communicated. Well, orally I, no i said if there are no questions we could talk about the documentation of the oral folk tale yeah um why yeah. don't we do that while while we're waiting for people to get their questions yeah. ready you, you know when i was uh, looking reading the folk tales for our own compilation there were certain interpretations by the folklorists which uh, were not incorrect so much as based on misunderstanding of local or, or of situations or, or perceptions even. Like uh, there is one line in one of the folk stories where 
the heroine is described as uh, shining. I mean, the comparison is of shining like a dark cloud. Now, in my imagination, or how it is read here, it is, and the, the writer, whichever of uh, the folklorists was, says he's referring to the dusky maiden. Now, for them, we were all dusky maidens, but to ourselves, we are less dusky, more dusky, you know, so on and so forth. And in the local context, that shining like a Barsat cloud is a contrast between the lightning of the Barsat cloud and the duskiness of the hair. So it's a, you know, that kind. So it, I just thought, okay, for all their insistence on accuracy, surely the, tra the transition from the Jumma the Bard, for instance, to the Munshi, to the Sahib or Mem Sahib's locally learned language, a lot must have been lost. Mm -hmm. But uh, later, many years later, we were sitting in Simurg actually, we got, found a storyteller, a Baba, Baba Inayat from uh, Kasur district. Mm -hmm. And uh, two things emerged. First, he told a story which had been written by, also is part of Flora Annie Steele's collection, which is known as Bopolucci. Oh, it sounds very Italian, it and it's a sweet little tale. Yeah. Baba and I first, and it took me a while to make the connection. Told me a story about Bopo Lucci. Now Lucci is something else. It is the transgressive, wayward, borderline bad woman. Mm -hmm. you know, she is out of control, and the story is very funny, very bawdy. Despite the fact that Baba and Ayat, and that is where the dynamics of class, gender, the language divide, the post-colonial language divide, where half of us speak English and the other, and the mass doesn't. And, and there, it's, it's a status thing also. So Baba and Ayat was very conscious that I was an English-speaking lady from a particular class. So he was, he was interlarding his tale with references to like, then her auntie said this. So I said, Baba, who's auntie? Can you use So I said, then please say it because uh, someone nahi aati. And uh, then he kept on hesitating and the story would break off until I realized he was holding back on the swear words. Now, when you speak, telling a tale in Punjabi and you are a man also, you can't tell the tale without interlarding it with five swear words a second. And poor man, he was also now conscious of my sensitivities. So it was an abortive measure, but the Bhopal Wichi story was extremely funny, which you don't find in the, in the folk tale. So it will take, and after that I asked Baba and I to tell the story to the men in the office, but the men were not good listeners. Mm -hmm. So the storyteller, it's a performance. If you don't have a good listener, the storyteller can't tell the story. So, I mean, it's my dream that one day I will go and collect these stories, taking with me a group of listeners so that we can sit somewhere because the, sto the storytellers are still there. And, but it's a dying breed. So that was my experience of the local recordings. That's a really wonderful um, narrative because so many things come out of that with regards to the act of ethnography uh, that was in a sense not intentional on your part and it happens in an exchange. Then that context of recognition and class difference where um, a narrative is being altered to please the listener to say this is what you need to hear or no this is not what you need to hear this is what you like to hear so i'm going to tell you what you like to hear and in a sense it's about self-censorship right you, you're kind of self-censoring what your own story is in the process of well not his own story but the story that he knows or for whatever reasons no 
about the euphemisms, like when he is talking of sexual relations, mm -hmm. he says, They got married then. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't get married, they were sitting on top of a tree. They couldn't have got married over there. But so it was a very funny, very body story. He got carried away with it and then he didn't know how to pull back. But he did pull back, but not enough so as to lose the story entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, great. Ah, um, so we have another question mm -hmm. from a couple of people. And we have the lovely Dr. Nadine Zubair, if she can make herself known and put this question to you directly. Nadine, are you there? Can we see you? Can you? Um, yeah, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. <laughs> well, that's probably a good thing. Uh, that was a, a, a very, very interesting uh, talk, uh, perhaps too much for my brain to process. So there are strands of it that I've picked out um, and, and, and I'm utterly fascinated. The question I have as someone who's also interested in using folk tales to understand the past is around the practice of it um, and, and, and to think about, you know, when we look at so I, for example, used Raja Rasalu a little bit to look at the, the role of uh, the carpenter and the blacksmith because I was studying material culture. I was studying wood carving from the Punjab. And so for me, the challenge was uh, pulling out, you know, the, uh, the carpenter uh, and, and, and worried that I would read too much into that. You know how, and, and so you're looking at the source, you're saying, okay, it's, it, it's for any steel telling me what the folk tale was. And now I am trying to build what a carpenter in the 19th century may have been. And I think it, it's that place where uh, I, lo I lost it, uh, very honestly. So in terms of how you work with folk tales in research to make them legitimately inform what you're doing, but without reading too much or putting too much of the present into the past, I think that's what I'd be interested to learn about, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it's tricky, Nadine, because, uh, you know, as I pointed out in the beginning, that the folktale is uh, not the sum of uh, people's manners and uh, history. It is not even an uh, unofficial kind of history. Uh, I think folk tale, in the folktale, given our vast class structures, I mean, I'm sure there's a greater significance that I'm not aware of. I mean, I would have to, I mean, I'm not a folklorist or an ethnographer and I'd have to do a lot of work on it, but uh, they represent the, low, the working people, the lower castes, as opposed to the rajas and the, even the saints or whatever, or the Brahmins. Uh, so wouldn't, I don't know how much you can find out about the historical status of the carpenter from the folk tale. He's very much there as part of uh, the social order and has his place in the hierarchy. Although in the folk tale that hierarchy is a bit, is fairly elastic. But uh, I don't know, I think we would have to be very careful. I actually would, I'm not knowledgeable enough myself on, on, on this to be able to say anything very useful. Uh, I would just err on the side of caution because it's very tempting to get hold of an idea and let it run off with you. I mean, I love to do it myself, but academically perhaps not, may not be wise. If, if I could follow up on, on, on that. So there was uh, an uh, a footnote in Swinnerton where he talks about blacksmiths and uh, carpenters having control of magic in villages. So it wasn't part of the tale. So this is okay, 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 okay. okay. So that gives it another dimension because in uh, in uh, in the stories of, 
in English folklore, as opposed to European, the smith who shows the horses and has the forge, he has a certain connection with the natural forces. I think it's the combination of fire and heat and uh, so perhaps the smith and the carpenter in the Punjabi folktale have a certain significance also. I mean, Swinerton was a folklorist. So he may have, uh, I mean, obviously he had more knowledge on that. But it, it would be fun to find out. I think it's very fascinating. Thank you. Yes, it is. And I do intend to sort of dig more into that. Maybe I'll contact you first. Yeah, Thank you. Really okay. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Nadine. There, there are a number of questions now I can see in the chat box. So what I thought, Neelam, we could do is I, if I can ask the various people to maybe if we take three or four uh, yeah. questions and you, if you like, I can summarize them for you at the end or if you want to make a note yourself. So I will just pick up the questions from the chat box and if you can just... Uh, come forward with it, please. That would be great. Um, there's a question from Mariam. Um, Mariam, would you like to um, make yourself known and put the question forward? Yes. Um, hello. I just want to know if Ms. Neelam can recommend a few texts that we can start with, if we have no prior familiarity with Punjabi tales. But, uh, your, your voice is, can you speak a little more clearly? G um, I just want to know if you can recommend a few texts that we can start with if we have no prior familiarity with Punjabi tales. Well, if you're looking at Punjabi tales in English, then uh, look for, are you based in England or in Pakistan? Pakistan. Okay, then Sange Meel has done reprints of the Swinerton tales, R.C. Temple's tales and Flora Annie Steele. You can pick them up from there. Uh, if you want to spend money, you can come and get the book from Seymour, but ours is an expensive coffee table book, which may be, you know, okay. not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank but, you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Mariam. And I'm really uh, sorry, I jumped, I, I missed Mohan there. Um, Mohan, please, would you like to come forward with your question? Uh, he was ahead of Mariam, but I, hopefully he's still there. Yeah. Mohan, would you like to please put your question to, to Neela? Yeah, uh, and no, no problem. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, Dr. Neela. I'm Mariam's friend. Um, not a folklorist, but um, I, I've often heard of some of these uh, folk tales, in particular the Here Ranja uh, story as being um, interpreted as a sort of you know, symbolic uh, Sufi analogy as well, an analogy about the different stations of the Sufi wayfaring journey and, you know, um, a, a symbolic allegorical way of talking about questions involving, you know, ascent and descent and, you know, relationships uh, to the beloved as a, as, as a figure of God. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you might be able to comment on this form of uh, understanding of interpretation that happens with these folk tales? Well, as compared to epics like Heer and Ranja, well, my access to Heer and Ranja is in Punjabi, and I haven't read any translations. And, but uh, yeah, the Rasalu tales, if this is what you were, if I got your question correctly, was documented by the English from the living stream. But alongside that, the same story, the story of Rasalu's older brother Puran, which triggers off the tale actually, Rasalu's adventures, has been written by Kader Yar, who is a Punjabi poet. And it's interesting how similar the texts are of the spoken oral tale and of the written tale. So somewhere there is an interaction between the two. And uh, one of the characteristics, because Pakistan, Punjab is still, I mean, all of Pakistan is still basically an or a very oral culture. There is a lot of improvisation that goes on. I mean, there's, for instance, in the wedding songs, 
uh, it is expected that when the wedding songs are being played, the singers will be picking up at ad ad-libbing, improvising, and changing the text to suit the situation. The bride, the bridegroom, etc., etc. And wedding songs, some of them are uh, very charming and lovely, and some are very, very rude. Uh, which and are addressed to the in-laws. So there's a lot of ad living there, and I think that same tradition I've seen even in the Kabbalis, when uh, there's a kind of mixing and matching going on between, uh, say, something from Khosrow being picked up and something else from somewhere else being picked up, and those two coming together. So this was happening, and certainly in the Puran tale uh, with the written text and the oral text and the kind of dialogic relationship between the two. But uh, insofar as he is concerned and its interpretations, you, you know, poetry is open to multiple in interpretations. And uh, in Urdu and Punjabi poetry, certainly there is this uh, uh, ambiguity where your beloved can be your nation, it can be your God, it can be your physical sexual beloved, or it can be anything else that you desire. The beloved stands in for the inaccessible object of desire which you strive towards. So, I mean, there are many, many interpretations of Heer. Some are very orthodox and conventional, some are more challenging. But one thing that does strike one is that uh, he is the one who has more agency than Ranjha. Uh, he is the more of the feminized figure, not quite, th than he is who is the actor, the ag more agentic person. And uh, but I must confess, uh, my reading of Heer has been purely for pleasure. I've not read it uh, academically or from the point of view of research. And uh, maybe I should, and then, and then we'll come and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're, we're all thinking, Ranja, Ranja, Kardi, Main Aap Hai Heer Hoi. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, they are um, the the chat box is exploding. We have lots of people, which is fantastic. Um, there's a question from Serena. Um, Serena, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Serena. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Nina. So um, I don't know. So yeah, I don't know very much about uh, Punjabi and uh, Punjabi poetry. So let's say it's the first time I I hear about this. Uh, but um, it happened that I I had the travel to Pakistan uh, two years back. So I noticed that uh, in um, Punjabi culture there is a lot uh, like uh, in everyday Punjabi culture there is a lot of magical elements. So it's uh, well reflected in the and also in the folk tales. But I'm, I'm trying to read the um, Varisha version in, in English translation, obviously. So I noticed that uh, there is a lack of these um, magical elements. So I would like to ask why, um, according to you, uh, the author uh, decided not to like, reflect this uh, aspect of uh, Punjabi culture, uh, which is very much uh, characteristic. So I didn't get the question. Amna, can you help me with this one? Would have some of the Aries? Yes, sure. I think the question is that uh, the, the Varis Shah version of Heer, uh, Ranja, if I've understood this correctly, yeah. uh, doesn't have um, the same element or magical elements that it, it's a bit more, if I, if yeah, I yeah. can interpret it, do you mean it's more secularized? Yeah. Is that the question you're asking? That, that Varus's version of He Ranja is more secular than, um, than fantastical? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's much more realistic than, uh, let's say, secular than the magical. Well, yeah. Serena, Varishya's here is not a folk tale. I mean, 
the folk tale was there the story was there which varis shah but varis shah is a literary rendition uh, i don't think varis shah intended to put in the magical element because uh, it would detract from the tale the tale is of uh, the the two protagonists and of society and of social mores and what impedes their coming together it is also about i mean there are many themes in it i don't have the text in front of me so but it is not a magical romance so to expect a magical romance from the, what something that does not intend to to have have magic in it is uh, i think well you're not going to find it there it is uh, because varis shah didn't mean it to be there the magical romance is the fairy or folk folk tale here is a literary epic which is very multilayered very open to multiple interpretations but it is a it is not a magical romance so you won't find the magic there okay thank you um and if i can maybe add to what neelam just said with regards to hir rancha coming out of the kissa tradition so the epic in that sense yes it, it's different the storytelling is different and it's uh, and and i think what varis has a very specific varis shah does have a very specific Uh, representation of the story there's some uh, interesting um, writings on this and scholarship on this that you might be interested in looking at um jeevan deol has has written on this and uh, farina mir has also written on on this so those might be um scholars that you would be interested in following up to to kind of look into it uh, there is uh, the earlier version of hero also by the mother samina rahman has just pointed it out which is a strongly feminist text i mean here is strong over there mm -hmm. and here is the one who's taking on the kazi here is the one who's fighting for her rights the right to marriage of choice her right to do, to her own life basically so these were strong texts and i think it would be interesting to explore the the strength of the punjabi heroine beyond the folk tale also but in the epics also because in uh, soni mahiban mm -hmm. again they're not passive the heroines of the punjabi epic yeah definitely not and i think also another thing we can think of over there the sufi tradition because in the sufi tradition i mean it it is writing in in a different way but also the whole construction of femininity is really interesting and the fact that you have women within the sufi tradition as well who have very a very strong presence and that the gendering of of women within that is 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 quite complicated as well so i think there are lots of layers to that story to unpack which which are fascinating as as neelam is pointing out um there are more questions coming up as well as suggestions that are going up in the chat box it's it's good to see the interactivity thank you everyone for being um super involved in this and engaged enam sorry enam nasir uh, are you there for your question you say you're in a noisy place so do you want me to put this question across or would you uh, enam we can try would you like to try putting your question across can't be heard okay um we can hear you Mm. Okay, so maybe I'll I'll put Adam's question. I I can't um, hear Adam. Sunil, is it possible to unmute Adam? Yes, I've unmuted Adam. Okay. He says very noisy here. Please, can you ask? Okay, so I'll ask. So she's wondering about the selection of folk tales discussed, and if there's a particular inspiration behind the selection. And she notes that she enjoyed the framing of laughter, uh, particularly people's laughter as anti-authority in current times where fascism is on the rise. Are there any useful lessons that can be drawn from this? And 
is there a greater urgency to start archiving these stories? So I think three questions rolled into one. I think there's a need to archive the living tradition and let, letting this, this be one of those moments when we stop the flowing stream and say, okay, at this moment, it is like here. I would like to find out what if any changes have taken place in it, in the folk tale from say, well, Eyal Khatun is not representative because she was not even, she was not even Punjabi based. So she was using the generic folk tales which are common to the region. But to see what changes have occurred since the time the British folklorists recorded these and to now, which is the post-Islamization, post-Talibanization, post-violentification of the entire world. Has it impacted it on the folk tale or has the folk tale flowed on minding its own business? Mm -hmm. That would be it. it. It may well have happened because entertainment channels have also moved to away from the folk tale to uh, television and internet and so forth. Uh, what made me select these stories, Anam, it was a, a very deliberate bias. I was wanting to, I mean, I was reading the folk tale and I was getting sick of hearing ki our tradition and our culture, which was being projected increasingly as misogynistic and uh, and being valorized for its misogyny. So I picked up stories in which we do have the more feisty, positive heroine who saves the prince from his folly. Mm -hmm. And uh, others like, and Rasalu is fascinating in its own, uh, own regard, except that in Rasalu also, Rasalu does not force himself on the princess who doesn't want to marry him. First, she accosts him. In the Rani Sohni Kahani, she accosts him. She hears because there's a prophecy that if Rasalu will come and marry the princess. And the day Rasalu comes, some omens are fulfilled. So people are expected. So the Rani, wanting to know what he's like, goes out to the stream to fill water where he's washing his face or something. And there she sort of flirts around with him and he ignores her and she speaks to him and he says, look, I'm a strange man in a strange land. And basically he's saying, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. God knows what I'll trigger off. And uh, she continues and then he says the lines I quoted also, Rani with your tresses loose, why did you come on the pretext of filling water because by that time he's realized that she's not an ordinary village girl. She's a, a, a woman of means. So I thought, let me take these stories and project them. There are, I, I feel so, I'm a bit sorry now, I didn't take the stories of the so-called wicked women, the witch sorceress women, because they too are not evil in that sense. Basically, they, they're one of the things that the Punjabi folk, uh, evil folk uh, woman does is she gets onto a tree, magics it, and the tree flies off with her. Now, the symbolism of something as deeply rooted as a tree, flying off with a woman who's also as deeply rooted and forbidden to leave the house and the four walls, there's something very energizing about it. And in one, the uh, it's the mother and mother of the prince and his wife who together go visiting and the prince is horrified and uh, basically it's not without my knowledge and permission and these are magical women and in another in which uh, the witch woman does take action against a king and changes him into a dog because as the story unfolds we find that he has done the same to her sister. So it's not the kind of uh, unmitigated evil, but uh, I wish, you know, there's a lot of that, but uh, Anam, if your question is answered, it was a single-minded agenda at that time to say, look, our tradition has feisty women who walk out of the house. Okay. Um, thank you. We've got, the, um, we've got a few suggestions here from Nadine about references to tales of the Punjab and um, 
There's also some from Samina, Rahman, Kader Yar, translated by Tofik Rafat. And um, so thank you. Thank you for all those suggestions. I think we have a hand raise from um, Rahi. Rahi, are you there? Yes, um, I'm audible. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you for letting me come on and um, thank you for a very, very enlightening talk. And I was, uh, I mean, I am particularly interested in your work because uh, my own um, doctoral project um, here at SOAS, um, you know, I deal with a lot of the similar questions that you discussed, um, but in the context of a Bengali literary genre called the Rupkatha, um, which has been commonly translated to English as uh, fairy tales and, um, you know, under props classification would be called um, wonder tales. Uh, so I basically wanted to focus on one of the questions you discussed, uh, which is that of the good woman and the bad woman. Um, and in the field of the Rupkotha, for example, because, you know, that is the field that I'm more familiar with. Um, so um, the characters of Shurani and the Durani, which who correspond to the bad woman and the good woman, respectively, mm -hmm. are possibly the most remembered female characters um, to the point that, you know, they live on to this day through proverbial usage. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, you know, as you have shown, and as I also find, um, there are such diverse representations of women in the tales. Um, there are women who are constantly transgressing um, <clears throat> various boundaries set for them and who have not been portrayed even within the tales as necessarily bad women for doing so. Um, so rather than you know, see some individual stories as representing feisty women, um, and this is a question that I obviously mm. think with respect to my project, can we then think of a methodology of reading these very imaginative texts that can look beyond this extremely limiting binary of the good and the bad? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think we should. Because I came, picked up the good and bad because I was, uh, you know, looking at it from the Cinderella syndrome right. uh, angle. Right. But uh, the Dua Rani and the Shua Rani you mentioned are present in the Punjabi repertoire also. Right. And but then, and then I think I read him in Lal Bihari Day's collection right. of Bengali yes. folk tales, yes. which is quite lovely. Yes. And uh, the, the, I mean, the storylines certainly travel across South Asia. They pick up local characteristics. And, uh, but uh, yeah, we should, we should uh, actually, it, should, it would be fun to look more deeply into and to look beyond the binaries and the categories, uh, which is what struck me when I was reading about the ogre Thiria. I mean, he's really, the brothers are nasty pieces of work, except that towards the end, you feel that, you know, he's lost everybody. He's the five brothers, one after the other, they've gone. His world is destroyed. His hunting grounds are gone. And Rasalu is still chasing him. And according to legend, he is still hiding in a cave in the, uh, uh, area above near the, in the Atak, uh, in the, or is it, uh, yeah, in that area, which is prone to earthquakes or seismic rumblings. And even now the locals say that it is Thiria getting fed up and saying, let me out. Because Rasalu put a boulder before him to keep him there. So there is a compassionate human dimension, a nuance, in the fairy tale, which we tend to maybe excise thinking that, oh, it's a fairy tale and these are the goodies and these are the baddies. Because we are so trained by the Walt Disney tradition, perhaps, in thinking of goodies and baddies. Right. Yes, thank you so much. OK, um, great. I think that's a um, really important question about methodology of reading and um, something that like Neelam said, we can all think about collectively as how how do we uh, develop that because reading is so individual to each person and to each uh, uh, the oral storytelling is is obviously a public experience as well as it is a personal experience, whereas the modern tale is is being read more in isolation and differently. So how do you 
how do you construct a methodology of reading around an oral um, tradition? I think that that's something to, um, yeah, that, to, to thrash out and think about and would be certainly fascinating. And it seems to, seems to me that in those contextualizations of ethnographies of these folk tales, that there is a particular way of reading them that is already representing them to us through um, through translations in English. And I think what was fascinating throughout all the conversations is, is to also listen to Neelam's um, response as a translator and uh, her own engagement and how that change, how meaning shifts and, and is constantly in flux in terms of where you are and who you are and who you, what you're talking to and speaking to. So it seems to me that both the storyteller and the listener are both in, in kind of constant um, interaction with that. Um, I think uh, with that, we are pretty much at the end of the, the, the only person I haven't. Thank you. Uh, Samina, I didn't know whether you wanted to ask a question. Uh, you had some comments. Oh, sorry. Can you can everyone hear me? Apparently, I was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So I was, I was saying I think everyone has asked the questions that were in the chat box. I don't know if there's any more questions, but uh, I was just wondering if Samina wanted to put a question across to you because there were some um, nice comments and interventions made there in the chat box. Um, Samina, are you there? Would you like to say something, or are you happy to stay in the chat box? Uh-huh. Okay, Samina, you're showing up. So that me are you happy to Mohan, I'm not Dr. Neelam. I'm plain Neelam. <laughs> okay. I don't I don't know. We can't hear Samina, so uh can you unmute Samina? We can't hear you. So Sabina Sunil is also saying that you just need to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Oh, great. We, I think we should be able to hear you now. Yes, I just wanted to say I want to go back to reading the tales again because this has been absolutely fascinating. And uh, one needs to go back to the tales, and I would like to also go back to Qadir Yar, and we'll discuss with Neelam what she feels about the poetic translation done by uh, by Tofi Krafat. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Samina. Um, would you like to respond, Neelam? Uh, no, we look at Kadir Yar. I, uh, I mean, I think I have the Punjabi text and uh, we should read it together. As far as Toki Rafat's translations are concerned, his own poetry is far better than his translations. I think, but I, I haven't, I can't remember his Kadir Yar, so maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I don't know. I'll have to. I mean, I just can't rule him out in one sentence without going back to his translations. But in his own poetry, I think he's a fantastic poet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, all right. um, great. Thank you. Um, so that um, really brings us quite nicely, I think, to the end of the session. It's been absolutely fascinating. There have been some fantastic questions. Thank you to all the participants for being uh, very, very engaged. That's been a wonderful, I think, part of this experience. Neelam, thank you so much for all the effort that and um, 
time that you've spent on preparing this for us. I know we've uh, we've asked a lot of you for three webinars, so this this is a fantastic start, and we look forward to the next next two. Um, I hope that you will join join us again. And um, all that remains is for me to thank Neelam for a wonderful and uh, thought provoking conversation about folk tales or wonder tales today. I've, I've learned a lot. I hope I, I'm, I think all of you have to and please, um, please stay tuned for the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Amna. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed it. Thank you.